Welcome to our international audience. This is Elaine, and we are also live streaming on Facebook Live at Resiliency Within. If you want to send me a message, you can reach me at Elaine at resiliencywithin.com. It is my honor to have on today's show, Dr. Mark Vonnegut, and he will talk to us about his new book, The Heart of Caring, A Life in Pediatrics. Dr. Vonnegut has spent 40 years treating children for coughs, fevers, ear infections, and more serious complaints. In that time, he's seen the American medical system change in ways he couldn't have imagined as a medical student, some of them good, others not so good. But what hasn't changed is his commitment to his young patients, whether recounting the cases that have stuck with him or detailing the changes in medicine that he has seen over the past four decades, the privatization of healthcare, the barriers to mental health services, the skyrocketing costs of insurance and pharmaceutical drugs, and the decreasing quality of care. Dr. Vonnegut is a personal guide through what is often seen as an impersonal system. He doesn't pull any punches in his criticisms of the medical industrial complex. His is the story of a life lived in medicine with all the hope and heartbreak that it entails. When I was getting ready for the show, I found a review of his book by Dr. Nancy Oriol, an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. And she stated that the heart of caring is a collection of stories from the heart of a caring physician. She says the book touched a nerve and made her cry and laugh. She went to say, on to say that it is, it is a must read for all new parents, old parents, medical students, physicians, patients, insurance companies, scientists, everyone. Pretty much, Mark, everyone should read your book. <laughs> so I want to just say a couple more things is after writing The Eden Express, which was a memoir detailing your struggle with psychosis and manic depression, um, you gained acceptance to Harvard Medical School and which you graduated in 1979, that you're the father of two grown sons and the grandfather of five. I'm jealous, I only have one. He lives with his wife and his youngest son in Milton, Massachusetts, where he continues to practice primary care pediatrics. And Dr. Vonnegut is, has authored a book in the past called Just Like Someone Without Mental Illness, Only More So. You can also find that book as well. Um, but I can't think of a better guest today. I, I told um, um, him in the green room that I thought it was serendipity that he was joining me today because of what has happened to the children of Ukraine in the last two weeks. But it's not only the children of Ukraine. You know, war is not a, chain, a stranger to children worldwide. And with the access of images of war on television and social media, all of the world's children can see the impact of war. I've asked Dr. Vanagat if he could also share with us, in addition to his new book and the, his wisdom on how to help children during these troubling times. So welcome, Mark. And as we get started today, um, is there anything that's on your mind? Ah, no, I think the Ukraine situation is really overwhelming. I mean, it's yes. something that I grew up thinking that tanks were going through cities and everything was in the past and that we would never see it again. Um, I actually remember uh, Hungary where the Russian tanks came rumbling through uh, and there were all the refugees um, and so, but it was, uh, it really was something I didn't, I, you know, it, it, it um, you know, I don't know how to explain it to myself, let alone explain it. Right. And I think like a lot of, of, of um, things we talk to children about, it's, 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 it's better to be a good listener than a good talker and find out, you know, what their concerns are. Uh, and kids are, they have a natural resiliency, which is severely tested these days. Um, but they have uh, a pretty natural empathy. Um, they take in what they can take in. And a lot of times if a child just really doesn't get something, if they're a really young child, they don't take it in, be it, you know, uh, be it death, disease, war, whatever. Um, and so I think a lot of times adults all want to be the perfect parent, but there's, I don't think there's anything to do here, except the, you know, you tell the truth about how you're feeling. Like I, I remember telling my son, it was around some political thing. I had the honor of driving uh, 
I call him my refresher course. He's now 19, but um, school every day. And, and it was something very upsetting. And I said, I grew up believing in this and this and the opportunities and everything. And now I'm really discouraged. And my 19 year old just turned to me and said, welcome to my world, dad. Oh and my goodness. Have, have sort of already uh, they are unfortunately old and wise, uh, and the world is not the wide open uh, place it was for me when I was 18 or 19, although Vietnam had kicked in by then, but I grew up really um, very optimistic and, and idealistic. And uh, Yeah, and I think I would have to agree that I probably grew up a, a similarly but we didn't have the same images available to us, I think, as the children of this generation have. And I was talking to a, actually one of my best friends from high school. I mean, I have to tell you how 50 years ago <laughs> when we were in high school and we were talking about um, she was telling me about her her um, grandchildren and her one of her granddaughters had said to her how, how they live in Silicon Valley. She said, I'm really worried. She, she told her grandma that there that the nuclear war could come to here, that they would send a bomb to our, our neck of the woods because of Silicon Valley. And that was right after the war had started um, the invasion by Russia to Ukraine. So how do you respond to, to um, a child that may be asking a parent that question right now? Mark, I know that's a, you don't know, have any easy answers, but maybe together, well, <laughs> collective what, wisdom. The real threat to kids and what they're really worried about isn't the nuclear bomb. Uh, they're worried about separation from their parents. And I think, um, you know, so for uh, uh, a parent to share their own tears and hopes and worries and stuff like that, then at least the kid doesn't feel alone. And I really think uh, the real danger um, is, is, is that they're gonna lose connection with their parents. Uh, yeah. And um, I, <laughs> number one, when you say, I, please turn off the TV. <laughs> <laughs> so that was what I, I was hoping that you're gonna say that this kids is, are getting too much, right? That are being pumped into their little eyes. And, and you're passively taking in, I mean, um, I, you have to keep up on events and I'm, you know, I, I, I'm a information junkie too, uh, but you can do something like scan the headlines of BBC News, which is slightly less histrionic. Um, but I think, please stop. I mean, I grew up watching the news with my family and that is, uh, that is a horrible thing to do with children now. Uh, yeah. So we need, to, we need to turn off the, and, and give them little sound bites. Right. If we're going to watch them, I think that's probably good for, do you think that's good for the parents too? Because I know that when you, when you're a pediatrician, I know you're taking care of kids, but you take care of the parents too, don't you? Many times. <laughs> yes. All the time, you know, they come and say, no, he doesn't have cancer, but why do you, you know, <laughs> what happened to you in your childhood? Yeah. And a lot of times I do. One of the things, if a parent really isn't understanding their child and feeling alienated, I, I you know, I hope that uh, the grandparent's alive. And I ask the mother to ask her mother what she was like as a child. Ah, that's you can, helpful. you can, um, but yeah, it's it's it really is uh, as a as a diagnostician. Uh, most of the time, I know whether you have a strep throat or an ear infection or pneumonia in less than a minute. So with this um, going on in this social media as well, because there's one thing about turning the TV on, but social media is a whole other mechanism that we certainly, when we were young, didn't have to deal with. And children are on that a lot. Teens, I mean, that's the way they communicate with their friends. What is your advice about social media? Because I know that kids are not going to leave their phones. No. Um, so how do we do that? Yeah. Unless you can get grownups to leave their phone. <laughs> I mean, because the grownups really are worse. We have a, you know, no cell phone beyond this point. So you'll be talking to a parent about a very serious medical thing that's going on. And so the child and you are having this conversation and the parent will say, oh, excuse me, I have to take this. You know, so, oh, gosh. It, it, so kids are used to being you know, cut off or say, hey, mom, you know what happened today at school? Oh, excuse me, I just have to take this. And um, so I think people should be aware that 
you know, grownups are in many ways with the social, they're worse than kids. Yeah. Uh, they're what more, are we role modeling? What are we ro role modeling to our children? Right. And you can have this thing. Okay. It's six o'clock. Everybody's cell phone goes into the lockbox. <laughs> ah, know? now that that's something that would be so every, so like you have these um, social media zone, free time zones during the day. Right. And, 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 but it is causing, you know, physical and mental distress to have, uh, not to be, I, I think teenage girls are particularly vulnerable to social pressures. And uh, so for somebody who, you know, it's an anxious time of life anyway, and to go to bed with a cell phone on your pillow that, that wakes you up at 3 a.m. and says, who likes who? And and, uh, you know, uh, and and the pressure they're on in grades and everything else, just please put the cell phones away. But I don't blame kids, you know, kids will say, well, what about you, mom? Or um, <laughs> there was one kid who was telling me that um, the, the, the father was driving them somewhere and he answered the cell phone and stuff like that. And the kid said, dad, you're not supposed to do that. And he said, this is business. So in other words, business and responding to a cell phone call trumps safety conversation. Oh my, no, that's kind of, that's not good. This is business. So, so we I, really have to think about how, what kind of role modeling we're doing for our children right. if we expect them to also dial down on their social media activity. Right, and, okay. you, and that goes for so much. I mean, if you, you know, uh, mother says, well, they're not getting enough exercise, they're not eating well or whatever. And so you just say, well, they're not going to do it alone. Well, the, the whole family is going to get rid of the junk food. The whole family is going to walk two miles a day. Yeah. The whole family is going to put their cell phone away. Because yes. to pick out, um, you know, the make the child the identified patient, which sort of is a way to say that the rest of the family and everybody else is fine, except, uh, you know, this one's grades aren't good and they've gained too much weight or what, what you know, whatever. Yes. You, you should never, you know, pick a child apart and say, uh, pick a child and separate them out and say, you have to do something special while your family's just fine. Well, I, I think I, I'm certainly feeling a little guilty right now because I think sometimes I'm too connected to my phone. So I'm going to bring this back to my family when we're all together. Maybe we should just have a little like a special box. We put them all in there, Look. iPads, iPhones, and okay, for this hour, we're just going to be the family. All right. That's, that is great advice. All right. And dinner, you have dinner without media. Yes, and you could t actually talk one on one to or within right. the family system. Okay, you don't have to be texting each other across the table. <laughs> okay, so let's move a little bit to um, our next question because I, I want to find out a little bit more about about you. So, why did you go into medicine? Why did you decide to take this path in your life? Ah, uh, it's it's. Um... There, there are good reasons. Like I think I grew up with a sense of wanting to be of service, uh, of feeling I, you know, I was going to be a minister for a while, um, and um, but I, and then thinking in the after the 60s when the world didn't end. I think we went out and started a commune thinking we needed to, to create a safe space for our friends and families. Um, but then when, when that sort of burned itself out, we found ourselves as being people in our mid twenties without jobs. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, what are you gonna do for a living? Yes. Right. And I had the additional, um, uh, well, it's a, a, the additional factor of having had uh, psychotic breaks and being in a hospital. So I looked back at all that and said, if it hadn't been for that, what should I have done? Well, I was good at chess. I was good at math. I love science. I should have been a doctor. Um, but I think part of it was um, I had a huge chip on my shoulder from being mentally ill and uh, desperately wanting to prove that I was not damaged goods. And if I could come out of there with a, you know, with a degree from Harvard Medical School, that would sort of prove that I was okay. Wow, so, I mean, it was really from 
I guess, from the challenge of having a mental health condition and mm -hmm. the suffering of that, but then to say, who am I? I mean, mm -hmm. I think that happens, you know, I hear I'm a licensed clinical social worker, people in, in medicine and in mental health sometimes say, oh, that's the person with that condition. We hear a lot, let's say of borderline, for example, mm -hmm. and then the person is no longer a person. Mm -hmm. They become this you know, constellation of symptoms that sometimes are not very positive. Yeah. So to actually pull yourself out of that paradigm, you mm -hmm. said, I'm going to show myself in the world mm -hmm. who I am, the full potential of who I am. Is that, I mean, I don't know if you were thinking those thoughts when you went into medical school, but I'm putting that on you right now. But I, I do think um, then and now um, there is a general underestimation of the capacity for people to recover from uh, mental illness. And, um, and so, um, and there was a, then and now there was a general ignorance about what causes mental illness. And, um, and, and so I felt um, there was part of, I need a job, I'm 25. <laughs> And, um, but it, there was also the sense of uh, this is really transformative kind of knowledge that mental illness isn't caused by a bad mother that, and that people can get well, that people aren't permanently broken. Um, and, and so certainly, I mean, here you are as a pediatrician for 40 years. And so what was the segue that went from, okay, I'm going to be a doctor and you got into medical school not a bad medical school, by the way, pretty good one. Um, and, uh, and then you decided on pedi pediatrics. What made you shift to that be your journey? It was the experience. One of the wonderful things about medical school is you get to, it's, it's like you get to be a surgeon for two months and you get to deliver babies for a month and you get to, and you see what you like. And it was um, the resilience and the liveliness of children yeah. and how they could, you know, w with a disease or an injury or whatever, um, you know, they sprain their ankle and they're better in a week. We sprain an ankle, you know, we're, we're in rehab and physical therapy for whatever. It, they, but, and it was also just liking being around pediatricians and yeah. finding that, that uh, um, if it was my sense of humor and whatever, um, whereas, you know, sometimes in some of the services, people were taking themselves so seriously. The thing I like about pediatricians is they didn't take themselves so seriously. And I also like to say, uh, we look younger than we are. And <laughs> we laugh. <laughs> well, I, I have also noticed about pediatricians. Now, I don't know if you agree with me, but I found there's a lot of sweetness in pediatricians, that there's a kindness that I sometimes didn't see in other professions. Um, not to say that, you know, we all have the capacity to be kind, but do you think that's true? I was going to get your opinion on that. Yes. And I think, I think we are allowed, um, because we're pediatricians, to be slightly childlike and sweet. Yes. Well, I guess the other thing that, that occurs to me, and I want to ask you this question, is that when you've had a mental health and, and condition. Um, and if you can work with children when they're young and, and shift the paradigm for them and their parents, that may, that may spark a completely different course for that child and their self view and also helping parents understand because we know that some conditions run in families, for example. So I, I, I like to say, let's talk about the biology versus pathology. I think mm -hmm. in Western medicine, we try to pathologize everything. And if we can bring in like the neuroscience and the biology of some of the conditions that happen, I think it can really shift how people look at themselves in my experience. So I don't know if you want to comment on that, whether that's part of your journey or not. Oh, I think it is. Um, it's, it's amazing to me. And part of the second book was just sort of, uh, I think, trying to say, you know, you can live a good and full life in spite of having mental illness and don't count too much on the so-called normal people to be supportive or empathetic or whatever. Uh, I, I, uh, I was giving a talk once and, um, and uh, I, I was asked, um, 
I, I think one of my sons was actually with me and they, somebody in the audience asked, knowing that mental illness is at least in part genetic, why did you have children? So, oh my. Yeah. And, uh, so, and I, I, I'd already talked to them about, you know, having, you know, a mind that can be a little too quick because that's, you know, um, and, and I said, I, 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 so much has said, well, other people's children uh, can sit on donkeys. My children are going to have no, have to know how to ride a fast horse. So I love that response. So um, I can't believe someone was so callous to ask such a question. People are amazing. Yes, they are. I think if you live long enough. They're amazingly um, wonderful and amazingly imperfect. I guess maybe I'll use that term. That might be a little kinder. Well, so let's, let's, uh, um, you know, I imagine you have, you have worked with so many different children and parents. Are you would like to talk about a couple that particularly come to mind that you would like to illuminate um, for the world to know about some special soul that you came across that <laughs> just like they're they're all special. <laughs> well, that's that's so nice to know. If I live where you live, I'd come to see you as an old person. Won't you see old people as well as, as young ones? How about old people that feel like a young person? <laughs> Mark, there you go. Okay, so tell me about one or two special souls amongst the many. They are the they are the funniest uh, straight. It, it, there's something about their innocence, like. Uh, telling a telling a boy that he had to go pee in a cup, which to us we understand that and everything, and he just looked at me and said, "What's wrong with your bathroom?" <laughs> <laughs> so, so another kid who's, who whose mother brought him in because he was you know throwing up once or twice a week and and ask all the questions about as to the mother and I look I say Frankie what do you what do you think's going on here and it he says. It's, she makes me eat eggplant. Eggplant is slow. <laughs> and, and, and that's when I throw up. And I look at it and mother got sort of, you know, and what I love is watching the interaction between a mother and child. She, she was outraged, so no outrage. <laughs> He was surprised and puzzled, so, but nobody's a <laughs> But such a, such a simple solution. Right. <laughs> Just stop feeding the child eggplant. He's going to be fine. <laughs> So, so I took organic chemistry and all those things to, to be able to say, here's what we're going to do. No eggplant for two weeks. Let's see what happens to the throwing up. He's Magically, it went away. So what I love is, you know, I do have, uh, uh, you know, you have to be able to make, you know, um, diagnoses and sometimes it's complex and stuff like that. But I think so much of medicine and pediatrics and elsewhere is just common sense, you know, and just sort of being and, and letting a child or a adult see something as something that they can in fact do. Well, I think, you know, you said it, you mentioned it in the very beginning when we were talking is sometimes the child gets identified as the patient. And it's not really the child who really has the problem. Right. I don't know. Can you talk a little bit more, more about that? Because I think I've seen that certainly as a mental health provider. They bring mm -hmm. the child saying, fix the kid. And then you start talking to the parents. You're going, oh, my gosh, the kids, you know, the kids taking bullets for the parents. The parents are arguing and the child's coming in with stomach aches and all sorts of stuff. And they say it's in your head. Well, it's mm -hmm. in the body, too. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you can talk a little bit about that, because I think that was such an important thing for us to to understand when we're thinking about helping kids. Walk through the process with the parents of saying, okay, well, what are you worried about? Um, and, and say, well, I'm worried it's a brain tumor or whatever. And then you do a very careful exam and you did it to say, it's, it, you know, it's not a brain tumor. Well, I worried that they could have celiac disease. Okay, okay, we can, but you go through all of that and then, uh, as you probably knew in the beginning, you don't come up with a ICD-9 diagnosis right. of specific illness. And you say, well, this is gonna be a process figuring this out. And I think, um, you know, it, it's, it's gonna be a family effort. And so then you, you know, you say, well, what was your child, you know? So I start, and then, and then I say, I, I'm not really, good at this. What you deserve is somebody who really 
you know, and just to, just to lead us in the right direction. I'm not saying you have to go to therapy every, but so, um, I, but I do think going through that process of knowing and ruling out the physical um, identified illnesses for the identified patient, and then you broaden the search to say, is I'm not going to figure this out. We all are going to figure this out, and we're going to try. Like we'll say, okay, we'll try uh, elimination diets, or we'll try uh, turning off all the screens, or we'll try the family walking three miles a day together, um, and it becomes sort of a group effort. But it's never just something the child is going to do. Yeah. So, I, so what I'm hearing you say is that when you see the child, you see the the child in the constellation of the family system. And what are all the factors that could be influencing the child? So if parents are out there listening, how they're in the this unknown world of, of uh, who are our listeners on Voice America, it's really important if you're worried about your child that it could be a larger issue. And to, to go see your pediatrician or your family practice doctor to kind of maybe sort it out. But I think the other thing that, I, um, that I'm getting from you, Mark, is that you are a very good listener. You have to listen to the kids and to the parents. And that's what I think what, I, what I'm doing during a lot of the exam is getting the parent to be quiet so that they have to listen to their to child, child. whether it's about the eggplant or, um, or whatever. And you can all, all, often see a parent just sort of standing to one side and watching a conversation with me, they suddenly start understanding and well, having empathy. I'm and also wondering too, is that we've been talking about, you know, the cell phones and how parents are very attached to their cell phones too. But at least for that moment, if you're, if the parent is with you with the child, and if you have a no cell phone zone, then the child gets to be present with you and the parent, perhaps in a way that's not too common. Right. So you're modeling something that's very important. Yeah, and 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 it works. And there's um, and for all the you know science and doctors like to think of themselves as uh, tough guys or whatever. Some of them, <laughs> um, but it's um, there is no there's there's no healing unless there is a real connection between. Uh, patient and the doctor. And at the same time, there's no connection unless there's really healing and the things sort of reinforce each other. Um, and, you know, sometimes you tell somebody you're going to do the exercise, the diet, you're going to get a puppy, you're going to do this. And people say, well, how will I know what's working? I said, you just, you know, that's exactly what you, where you want to be. You want well, to be I I would have wanted you for a pediatrician if you would have said my cure was a puppy since I love dogs. Well, we're, and as, we're, as I'm saying that, I noticed that we're going to have to take our break in just about a minute. And I, we're, and I think we've gotten through two of our questions. So <laughs> I had the funny feeling that once we started talking with Mark Vonnegut, that we would have uh, plenty of time uh, or I don't know, we would... Um, have wonderful conversation and we'll just have to see what happens afterwards. I might have to invite you for part two um, to come back on the show. So um, we're going to go and take a small break right now. And I'm going to thank the Trauma Resource Institute, who is our sponsor of our show, who um, is helping us to bring you people like Mark Vonnegut to the airwaves of Voice America. And just to also to remember that we have many listeners. I, um, I went through and we have people that have listened to our show from 22 different countries so far. So we're really proud of that. So we will see you back in just, a, we will hear you back in just a, a very few, few moments. We'll be back with uh, Mark Vonnegut who will share more of his wisdom with us. Okay, great job. We're all... Welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Mark Vonnegut. We're talking about his new book, The Heart of Caring, A Life in Pediatrics. We've really just been having a wonderful chat about his wisdom and sharing some of the gems of the special souls that are in his practice. He still has an active pediatric practice. Now, are you in Boston? Is that where your, um, your practice Quincy. is located? Quincy, which is just south of Boston. Um, it's right near what they call the Braintree Split, where you go in one direction, you go to the Cape, and the other okay. direction, 
go to New York or wherever. So it, it's convenient from uh, lots of different directions and we're on the T, which lets us have a really wide variety of patients, which, I, which, which, is, which is great. Don't want to have all the same people. Yes, and we were talking um, during our, um, our little short break and you were, we were talking about tears and I had mentioned that um, a dear friend of mine, Magdalena Serrano, talks about sweet tears. And I had, I had um, made the assumption that you have shed many sweet tears in your life, as well as I'm sure sorrowful tears. And you, sh- you were beginning to share a story about a young man with, that was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Do you want to share a little bit of that on the air? It's such a sweet story, Mark. It was... <laughs> In the beginning of trying to figure out what his weight loss was about and everything else, and it was just sort of a coldish clinical kind of thing, and then the x-ray, and I I recognized what I thought was going on and was making the diagnosis, and then it was confirmed, and then that sort of clinical approach kind of fell apart, and um, and I, I, I literally started crying. And, and so here, my, my patient with the cancer is saying, it's okay, Dr. Vonnegut, it's, mm. you know, uh, we've, I think it's an 80% cure rate. I've got, you know, if I want to have children, um, you know, it's just, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it, the chemo is not that bad. And, and, but the thing is, here's somebody I took care of when they were a baby who now has cancer, who is now comforting me and telling me that it's going to be okay. Uh, what other job can you have that happen? Well, it just seems like there's so many heartfelt moments that you've shared with people. And there's, there's something that you shared with me before we got on the air, which is something that you've carved in your, in your office. Could you share the, the, what's on the carving in your office with, with our, our listeners on Voice America? So many new parents are beating themselves up over whether, um, whether to do a circumcision or not, uh, how to breastfeed, for how long, is it okay to use a breast pump? Uh, when do you introduce solid foods? When do you, uh, and stuff like this. And so I took this piece of, piece of ash wood, which is a very bright hardwood, and I took a router and I made it into it, it says, feed the baby. And I will come and show this to mothers. And say, <laughs> If you want to beat yourself up, I have a stick here you can use. Just feed the baby, and uh, and see that's a, it means so many things. Feed the baby, of course, but and that's that's why that's why it's a good stick to have around. Well, you know when I when I when I heard it, um, I often talk with people that are struggling with self compassion. And there's something about the statement of feed the baby. It's like, oh, just feed the baby inside of you. That innocence that we all have that can get shrouded with mm-hmm. all the things that happen to us in life, the judgments that we make on ourselves or that others make towards us. But if we just kind of rock and feed that baby, that's not yeah. only. And that's how you, sweet you soul. know, yeah. you, you are a perfect, if you can feed the baby, you are the perfect parent. Yeah. So. Can you tell us maybe a few more stories about your patients? Um, I know you're still actively seeing them and um, I just love to hear the story. So I'm gonna ask you, you know, is there another one that comes to mind? Oh, it's um, sometimes uh, you are just, you know, I feel just sort of like awed by the courage of, of people. I mean, this couple that came to me said, you know, we know through amniocentesis that where our child is going to have osteogenesis imperfecta, which is a dreadful, dreadful illness where your 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 bones are actually eggshell thin, and and they said, uh, you know, we want you to take care, uh, help us take care of the child. We absolutely will not uh, terminate the pregnancy, which would have been the advice of ninety percent of of. Uh, and so, um, and, and then, uh, you know, watching this family uh, deal with this and, and on the other, the other parts of the book are how difficult uh, insurance people make it to take care of a child with serious asthma, osteogenesis, Hodgkin's disease, you name it. 
uh, the disease is bad, but the trauma is compounded by, uh, I mean, this child was told that no, the insurance wouldn't pay for a special car seat, that they had to go to Medicaid to get the special equipment and so forth. So here they are dealing with a child who was born with over 120 fractures, even by mm -hmm. C-section who we have to lay down on an exam table and they are having to deal with a case manager who's telling them what they can't get that they did you know so but anyway it's sort of the whole picture of the courage of these people um and 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 watching this child become a little bit tougher and then a little bit tougher and he's he's he is going to be going to be short he's going to be all these things but you know he he has a you know he he's going to be a marvelous something but just but just getting to be part of that picture rather than uh the average uh medical encounter now you are seen by somebody you've never seen before you're never going to see again who probably is not going to get any follow-up in, in terms of, of how you do. Um, and so there's no connection. There'll be no healing. So this is very worrisome. So I mean, it doesn't sound like children are going to get the best care or the parents are going to have the confidence and the trust in whom they're seeing because it's a stranger. And that doesn't sound like the way that you conducted your practice over 40 years. You don't seem like you're the stranger kind of pediatrician. So how do we is there a way to still in today's world with all the, uh, the changes to still have that modicum of the pediatric uh, provider for, the, for that child and that family that builds trust over time? I mean, is it gone or I don't know what I, I don't want to be too pessimistic about it, Mark, but I mean, maybe it is. I don't know. I, but I'd like to be optimistic and say this is going to be a great opportunity for us to learn how to take care of each other and ourselves because we're not going to get much help from doctors and hospitals. Huh. So that's the so, and I do think, um, you know, I do think the way I practice medicine is, um, you know, the insurance companies would say it's too expensive or whatever. So you really have a, uh, um, a system which has very little to do with healing and a great deal to do with money. Um, and, and so can I say, oh, we're all going to get together and the nurses are going to lead us and we're going to get better quality care and more nurses in the hospitals, which is what we need and so forth. Um, I'm not sure that's going to happen. I think we are going to have to reinvent and help each other because uh, I don't think, I, I think, um, you know, we call ourselves dinosaurs, but I think pediatricians that actually um, get to know and have, you know, have a staff that cares and stuff like that. It's not a good business model. Huh. So, so what kind of advocacy do pediatricians do to try to change the system i mean you sound from what you're saying like with the, the child that needed the the car seat that mm -hmm. i imagine that you've had to write letters and be an advocate for that child and systems that seem you know like you can't penetrate them um and i imagine you've been somewhat successful but maybe not all the time so you know so what are some of the 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 i don't know i guess if we can t talk about some solutions um if you're that parent with that special needs child you know, how do you negotiate these crazy systems? I don't think you, the, the thing is it's set up so that we as individuals, as doctors, as practices, as specialties, we're all playing one-on-one -on -one against, uh, you know, it's like a game of poker where the other guy has all the chips. Uh, I can't, I do have to write letters that say, uh, Maggie still has no left leg, uh, you know, or this this patient, you know, still needs a wheelchair. I honestly, in my mind, I say, what does the insurer think? And I think what the insurer thinks is that at some point I'll give up and stop writing the prior authorizations for the necessary stuff. At some point, it'll be too complicated for me, too expensive for me to take care of complicated patients. So they will just be sent to emergency rooms and get lousy care because that works out best. So I'm very cynical. Uh, I would love it 
if people would notice things like what we did to deal with COVID-19 is we dropped co-pavements. Nobody, I don't think very many people noticed that, but that was a necessary uh, thing to make uh, medical care much more efficient, safer, all the things we want it to be. And it saved patients hundreds of millions of dollars. Co-payments are, you know, they're, they're horrible for everybody. Even if you've never been sick a day in your life, the co-payments are part of what jacks medical care up. So your family is paying $20,000 a year to access nothing because you have a $6,000 deductible. So it's really a horrible, horrible system. And if people would say, oh, it's all of us, and doctors are just as bad, like the doctors at Mass General say that they wanna make more money than the doctors at Beth Israel, and the doctors at Beth Israel are ticked off because they want a better contract. So, um, so instead of getting, being together and saying, we're all being treated badly, <laughs> um, and, and, and we, are going to stop doing things that hurt patients and prior authorizations, deductibles, uh, enhanced reimbursements, quality, all of these things which sound good, they all harm patients. And we took an oath to not harm patients. Well, so you, were, you mentioned a dinosaur a little bit ago. So because you're older, um, do you see a difference generationally between doctors? I mean, I, I mean, what kind of advice do you have for people even going into medical school right now? Because when you you decided to become a doctor back in the '70s, it was a different system than there is now. Very so, ideal, and it, and it really was. You know, the the most important thing is what do patients need, and everything else was secondary. And that's uh, not now. It's 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 more. You have to see what can I get for the patient in light of the insurance that the, that the patient has. I talk to um, medical students about mental health and, and things like that. I remember giving a talk and at the end, uh, a woman in the back raised her hand and I said, what? And she says, when do we get to help people? Mm. I mean, and, and so, everything has become, okay, well, we have to survive economically and we have to do this nonsense or that nonsense or all this stuff. And then what resources do we have left for the patient? And the yeah. truth is we have less and less and less. Well, and I guess that brings me to my next question. And that's about, you know, mental health parity. And when you see children who have um, a mental health condition, anxiety, depression, kind of like the meat and potatoes of, of mental conditions. I mean, what kind of help are they getting? Um, you know, there's been all sorts of um, information about the pandemic and that there is greater anxiety and depression in our young people than ever. Mm -hmm. And the pandemic has taken a heavy toll of being, you know, away from friends or, you know, back in school now, but that doesn't, I've, I work a lot with teachers and teachers see a difference of children coming back after having been away for so long. Mm -hmm. And they're really worried. And a lot of teachers are leaving the profession, just mm -hmm. like a lot of nurses are leaving the profession um, and, doctors. Yeah, and doctors as well. So, you know, so any, any, um, what's your, what are your thoughts about this? You know, being someone who so believes in mental health. It's, you know, it really is a crime and uh, again, it turns down to uh, out to be about money. If an insurance company can get out of paying for uh, ABA for autism, the, the, you know, or uh, or just plain old psychotherapy, or um, if they can get out of paying for something, they'll get out of it. And so it leaves people in the lurch. Uh, mental illness, like everything else, uh, if you don't treat it, it becomes chronic and it becomes untreatable. Um, but this, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the hospitals, uh, 
psychiatric hospitals, but also just plain old rural hospitals and urban hospitals that served the under, those hospitals are gone. And it was just like, you know, a corporation bought them out, decided it was more profitable for them to not exist and they don't exist. So there's a lot of care and it's especially noticeable in terms of behavioral health and kids because you have, uh, you know, an, you know, a very troubled child, whether it's um, suicidality or whatever, uh, and the, there's no place to put these kids. So they are in an emergency room, um, possibly never seeing a psychiatrist, waiting to get a bed placement. There are fewer and fewer beds and people say, well, isn't that good? Kids aren't being institutionalized anymore. I said, no, it's not good because you know, doctors should actually be in charge of who needs to be hospitalized. It should not be a decision made by a bureaucrat who is serving somebody who makes $50 million a year. That should not be who's making your decisions about who gets hospitalized and who doesn't. So in terms of mental health, um, what do you think knowing that there is a problem, and I've certainly been in that situation trying to find even a bed someplace for someone, and there's definitely more people that are in crisis than there are the, the mental health, let's say even facilities for acute mental crises, um, mm -hmm. especially for people that are of moderate means. Um, it can be quite difficult if impossible. Mm -hmm. So what do you think are some of the solutions? Um, uh, seeing if you can look into your magic ball and you can give us all the solutions to the medical crisis of our country. But I mean, right. you've got a lot of wisdom, Mark. So what, what are some of the things that you think we could do differently? We take all the money we, we spend on uh, oh, uh, ridiculously priced atypical antipsychotics. Uh, we give it to, to uh, mental health workers and nurses and we re rebuild a few hospitals and we let people who actually went to medical school decide who stays how long. And it's, it's, it's so we are, you know, the amount of money we are wasting on medicine, which is basically being used to kick people out of the hospital after two weeks and decrease their chances of relapse. But also, if you keep people on those medicines, they're not going to medical school. So, and so that's kind of, I'm gonna kind of circle us back to you now. And because when we first started talking, you said one of the, you know, there you were 25, you'd had a mental health crisis and you were gonna, you were going to show yourself and others that you are a whole person. And here we are now talking about all these things that are happening in the world. And I'm just wondering in the vista of who you are today and thinking back to that young man that you were many years ago, you know, what, what, what are your thoughts about this? Um, I, I think <laughs> young people with mental health issues, um, think that they're the only, like they're the only 10 year old anxious girl who has ever been. Right. Um, and so, or, and, and so job one is, you know, you're not alone. There are a lot of, of kids, a lot of kids have recovered. These are the things they've done. Um, the other thing is that you can get well in spite of your parents, in spite of your society. The, the worst message which we got in the 60s was that mental illness is a sane response to an insane society. And so you look at that, it sounds sort of poetic, but say, then how the hell do I get well? Yeah. My society is not gonna, so, so you have to say that your mental health does not depend on the mental health of the so-called normal people, the parents, anybody, this can, you can from within, I like the name of your show. Yes. Uh, the, you know, you can, um, you know, find the resources, the connections, you can get better. Thankfully, you do not need your mother to get better. You, know, you don't need your, you, you know, you don't need uh, Putin to get better. You don't, you don't need, um, you can, um, you know, be strong from within. And yes. you have to be because you can't count on the, you know, employee assistant program, or you can't count on, these people are nice and they can be of somewhat help, but you cannot feel that you will not get well unless 
you know, the world treats you better unless you get a job. Well, so um, Mark Vonnegut, you have been the most wonderful guest. We have talked about such important issues today, not only about what's happening in Ukraine, but something dear to my heart, which is mental wellness and mental health. But what you just shared with us is what else is true. That I hope that every young person, every person out there that may be struggling with a mental health condition can hear the words of Mark Vonnegut, that there is hope, that there is something from within that with support and people that care about you and with, a, with you know, I guess your own courage and strength as well, Mark, that um, you've had 40 years of what sounds like a very worthwhile life where you've contributed so much to so many people. And I wanna remind everybody that Mark's book is called Heart of Caring, A Life in Pediatrics. And where can they find this book, Mark? Where should they go? We talked about it before. They should, they should go to their independent bookseller. Okay. Unfortunately, might not. If that exists in your community. Yes. Uh, you go down the line and uh, you know, ultimately, um, you know, you can Google it, you can find it other places or whatever. Um, and, um, you know, I, it made me feel a lot less like a victim to have written the book and just sort of lay out. And as, as I say, as a love letter to my profession and my patients, and I'm afraid people aren't going to be able to get that same care in the future. Well, the, the love letter certainly was shared today on the show. And I want to also let people know that they can get in touch with you at www dot go to mvpeds.com if they'd like to contact you directly and as we i cannot believe we're in our final minute it's gone by so fast but i want to share something from mahatma gandhi if we are to teach real peace in this world and if we are to carry on a real war against war we shall have to begin with the children and you certainly are that person i have a little chill when i say that to you because you've been living that um, so again, it's been a great honor to have you on the show. Until we meet again, signing off on Voice America, this is Elaine miller Karras. I'll see you next time at the same hour with um, celebrating Social Work Month with two lovely women from Loma Linda University who are spreading healing throughout the world, Kimberly Freeman and Dr. Beverly Buckles. <music>